Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Boulder. My name is Chris Zanoni, and I'm very pleased to be your worship leader for today's service. I'm so grateful and delighted to see all your lovely faces. We welcome all at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Boulder. All of you are welcome, and all of you are sacred. Whatever your past was like, whatever this present moment is like for you, we invite you to journey into the future together. And welcome to everyone joining us via the magic of the internet. We are delighted that you're here. This congregation is all of us, together, in person, and online. If you're a new online visitor, you'll find a link to our visitor form in the video description. Or send an email to the office and let us know how you found us. I do have one announcement, just to uh, let you know the annual congregation meeting is scheduled for May 22nd. After this service, stay tuned for more details in the messenger coming ahead. It is good to be together on this gorgeous and slightly colder than I expected spring morning. <laughs> At the 9 o'clock service, the kids did a maypole dance for May 1st for Beltane. And they said the wind was not too strong to blow the ribbons away. And, and that, hey, it wasn't snowing. So it's <laughs> perfect day, perfect May 1st. Our words for the call to worship this morning are words I return to often by Rebecca Edmiston Lange, words that I need to hear and I think we all need to hear regularly. She writes this, come in. Come into this place, which we make holy by our presence. Come in with all your vulnerabilities and strengths and fears and anxieties. Come in with your loves and hopes, for here you need not hide, nor pretend, nor be anything other than who you are and who you're called to be. Come into this place where we can heal and be healed, where we can forgive and be forgiven, Come into this place where the ordinary is sanctified and the human is celebrated and the compassionate is expected. Come into this place. Together we make it a holy place. Will you rise in body or in spirit? Let's start by singing together. Botanist, the researcher Hope Jaron, from her memoir, she says, <clears throat> she says a seed, a seed knows how to wait. 
Most seeds wait for several years before starting to grow. A cherry seed can wait 100 years, no problem. What exactly that seed is waiting for is known only to the seed. Some <laughs> unique trigger combination of temperature, moisture, light, many other things are required to convince that seed to jump off the deep end, to take its chance, to take its one and only chance to grow. But a seed is alive while it waits. Every acorn on the ground is just as alive as the 300-year-old oak that towers over it. When you go into a forest, you probably tend to look up at the plants that have grown so much taller than you. You probably don't look down where in a single footprint, in a single footprint of forest is something between a hundred and a thousand seeds, each one alive and waiting. And when you're in the forest, for every tree you see, there are no less than three million more waiting in the soil, wishing to be. I wondered if that was the case in a dry climate like this one, too. <laughs> Hope grew up in Minnesota, I think. But a ponderosa pine, a mature one, produces something like 25 to 50,000 seeds a year. When you're in a forest, for every tree you see, there are so many more below waiting and hoping to be. When, when the embryo within a seed starts to grow, it basically just stretches out from this doubled over posture and it elongates into official ownership of the form that it assumed years ago. The hard coat that surrounds a peach pit, a sesame, a mustard seed, a walnut shell, all of those, those exist mostly just to prevent that expansion until the right time comes. In the lab, she writes, in the lab, we simply scratch the hard coat and add a little water and it's enough to make almost any seed grow. I must have cracked thousands of seeds over the years, and the next day's green never fails to amaze me. Something so hard can be so easy if you have a little help. In the right place, under the right conditions, you can finally stretch out into what you're meant to be. Each beginning is the end of a waiting and we're each given exactly one chance to be. Each of us is both impossible and inevitable. And in each full tree was first a seed that waited. If you're joining us online and have a candle or a chalice nearby, please get ready to light it. We invite you to type into the chat box where your chalice is lit, the street or neighborhood, or what city if you're joining us from outside Boulder County. I'd like to invite Diane Curlett to light this morning's chalice. Good morning, everyone. I'm Diane Curlett, and I'm grateful for this morning for this big tent of Unitarian Universalism welcoming me to return to community in this place. I love the concept of linking inner harmony with a recognition of beauty, and I love using spiritual practice to attain and maintain inner peace. The traditional Navajo or Diné people believe one should strive to maintain the state of Hosno, roughly translated as living in balance or harmony with all manifestations of the universe. Other people, animals, nature, the life cycle, order, control, and oneself. Living in beauty may be a means of maintaining or recovering Hosno. This morning I will share portions of Walking in Beauty, which is the closing prayer from the Navajo Way Blessing Ceremony. In beauty I walk, with beauty before me I walk, with beauty behind me I walk, with beauty above me I walk, with beauty around me I walk, it has become beauty again. Today I will walk out, today everything negative will leave me. 
I will be as I was before. I will have a cool breeze over my body. I will have a light body. I will be happy forever. Nothing will hinder me. I walk with beauty before me. I walk with beauty behind me. I walk with beauty below me. I walk with beauty above me. I walk with beauty around me. My words will be beautiful. In beauty all day long, may I walk. Through the returning seasons, may I walk. On the trail marked with pollen, may I walk. With dew about my feet, may I walk. With beauty before me, may I walk. With beauty behind me, may I walk. With beauty below me, may I walk. With beauty above me, may I walk. With beauty all around me, may I walk. In old age, wandering on a trail of beauty, lively, may I walk. In old age, wandering on a trail of beauty, living again, may I walk. My, wor my words will be beautiful. I like this challenge for all who want to walk in harmony and beauty. We now invite all those gathered in your various locations to join together in fellowship and community as we all say aloud together our congregation's covenant. We gather in fellowship to speak truth to each other, to reach out and touch one another, to care with each other, and to seek the truth divine. So be it. Friends, will you come with me into a time of stillness, a place of prayer and meditation, of settling into this moment? And in that spirit, let's take a breath together. And another but slower, in for four and out for six. Sometimes we try to think our way into different action. Sometimes that's good. But part of the work of practice is to act our way into different thinking. Part of the point of practice, of slowing down, of the breath, of centering, of feeling the weight of your body pushing down into your seat and your seat back against you. All of that is action to change the way that we think to let the tangle of our mind untangle just a little bit, to let our busy brains quiet themselves down and listen for self or soul or God or holy. Our words for meditation are by Jess Reynolds called Everywhere, Everywhere. Ask me where my fear grows, everywhere, everywhere. Out of broken light bulbs, through the cracked dirts of gasping riverbeds, in the rough green of every forest and climbing from the screen of every television like some sickly antenna, poison berries on a vine, every staircase as moss thick as the stairs where I sat at six and watched a fire burn through my backyard. Ask me where my hope grows, everywhere, everywhere. Deep in basement corners, 
from the ragged concrete edges of sidewalks in the city, quick and rough like fingernails on the hands of someone who doesn't bite them like I do, green spilling from the mouths of children running wild from the hands of the librarians who taught me to see what I could be worth. I don't know how anything grows when I can't remember to fill a watering can or how to check the soil to see if it's too dry. I don't know what green thumbs are, or chlorophyll, or gardeners. I, I don't know how the sun remembers to rise, or the trains remember to run, or how people remember to be good and generous and kind when their hearts are always breaking. This is all I know. The flowers will grow. The flowers will grow. We'll be together in silence for seven breaths. Each week in our service, we set aside time in ritual to remember and reveal the joys and the sorrows, the hopes and the fears that weave among the fabric of our life. And so in just a moment, as the music begins, I'll invite you to come forward to take a stone, a little piece of the mountains, and hold it in your hand to feel its weight, like the weight of your care your worry, your joy, and then to place it into the soil, the sacred earth, the land of the Ute and Arapaho people, in symbol of how each of our own things, each of our own issues, our problems, our hopes, take their place with each other, none of us alone, held in the hand of something larger than ourselves. I lift up this week, David and Lisa Hughes, whose house burned down in the Marshall Fire and who just this weekend moved into their new home. And I lift up Wynn Bruce. A week ago, in front of the Supreme Court, Wynn set himself on fire and died in self-immolation to bring attention to climate change. He was a member of this congregation for at least a few years in the 2000s. Some of you know him or danced with him. In the Buddhist community where he'd been active these last years, the leaders said a thing which haunts me. They said, if we had known, we would have done anything we could have to stop him. They said, setting yourself on fire is not a tactic to stop climate change. And they said, we understand why he did it. Please come forward as you feel moved.
a dinner on Friday night with a farmer who told me they had learned long ago from an elder, from a mentor, that each animal they raise has its own needs and its own self. That there is the pigness of a pig and the chickenness of a chicken and the horseness of a horse. And each of them has their own needs for food and space and bedding and shelter, sunlight and water and company and care. I don't know even one thing about horses or pigs or chickens, but I have both cats and dogs. And I know the catness of a cat is not the dogness of a dog. If you give the animal what it needs, he said, the farmer, he said, if you give it what it needs, what accords with the pigness of the pig, it's calm, it's happy. It doesn't fight back against you, irritated always. What is the humanness of a human? What are those needs for you? What is in, in your food and shelter and bedding? What, what is the proper mix of company and care and silence and solitude? What sustains you? What is that recipe? In mystical traditions of Judaism, the tree of life is a diagram of 10 interconnected aspects of existence, 10 spheres, they're called sephirot, emanations of God into existence, arranged with 22 paths between them. Maybe you've seen this. So there's a, a center column of four of these, and then on either side, three, and lines connecting and interconnecting them. In that tradition, the tree is a sort of a map of creation, not of tangible reality, but a map, a, a guidebook to the nature of God and the nature of the human soul and reality. Each of the spheres represents a particular spiritual principle, uh, wisdom, understanding, kindness, discipline, and so on. And these aspects are a way of, of mapping, a way of trying to comprehend a God who in Jewish tradition is ultimately unknowable, who can never be directly apprehended and is entirely beyond human experience. But, but this tree of life isn't just sort of a philosophical abstraction because it's also written into our bodies. Each of these 10 aspects corresponds to a part of your body. Uh, wisdom in the left brain and understanding in the right. Kindness in the left arm and strength in the right, and each of those physical parts correspond to emotional experience and color and on and on. And for a follower of that tradition, the work is to bring all of these aspects in balance with each other. It's not about what is the aspect of myself that I like the best and how do I extinguish all the other ones so that there's like only compassion. It's to bring all of these things into balance. The goal isn't for one of these to triumph over the others, but for all of them to come into harmony, into a sort of dynamic equilibrium. We work to balance that part of ourself wanting justice with that part of ourself wanting mercy. A person cuts you off in traffic, and you hope and pray for the police car just around the corner that pulls them over. Justice. <laughs> in balance, with someone cutting you off in traffic and remembering all those many times that you yourself, <laughs> I'm not leaving anyone in this room out, you yourself have done that. Not forgetting that part of yourself which imagines you in their shoes late for work or late to go home, simply having had a bad day or not let, knowing how they're gonna let go of their own aggressiveness. That, that compassion piece and that justice piece, the goal isn't for either one of them to win out, but to come into balance with each other. In a broken world, the map offered by the tree of life suggests a way that our right actions bring ourself and our world into balance. 
you heal the world by healing, by observing and honoring, uh, uh, <laughs> honoring and integrating. I'm laughing because at the 9 a.m. service, I said exactly that same thing. <laughs> Also, not intentionally, but this is a great word. It's unagrading. <laughs> so we're, it's it's copyright now. Uh, unagrading, honoring, and integrating, right? All those different parts of the self. That fanatical part that wants justice done at any cost, with the part of ourself which sees the suffering. My friend Anna tells the story of overhearing someone at her gym, who is not in balance, someone at her gym ranting when the satellite TV went out during a snowstorm. He was outraged, she said, morally indignant. And he was looking to me as if I might commiserate with a fellow victim of this injustice. I said nothing, she goes on. I said nothing, but I felt something close to despair as I thought back on the many interactions I've had with other people indignant about an elevator being too slow or their preferred brand of whatever being temporarily unavailable. It's, it's not just the garish privilege entailed in this kind of complaint. It's not even the utter lack of perspective. It's that our innate spiritual sense of injustice, our natural capacity for outrage when we encounter wrongdoing, had been co-opted and displaced onto this consumerist theater. The precious resource of our outrage, our brain power, our words, our sacred energy is wasted on fake resistance that is a part out of balance. That outrage is indeed sacred and a piece of you and one not to let go of. The work is not to stop being outraged, but to bring that into balance, to temper it. A few years ago, my wife, Reverend Terry, who will be preaching here at the end of the month, um, uh, I actually just call her Terry. Um, <laughs> Terry started growing orchids. Every so often we'd get one of those, you know, those like little $20 orchids from the shop. Sometimes you see them at the front of the supermarket. And she would water it every day and give it light, and then it would die. <laughs> Until she discovered that what those orchids needed were once a week to be taken out of their pot, submerged entirely in water, the whole root ball and dirt submerged in water for about 10 minutes. Then you put it in the colander to drain, and then you put it back in the pot again, and you don't touch it for another week. I am, I am, you should talk to her about this. I cannot give you farming advice here. <laughs> and I have no idea if this is true for other species, but what she explained to me is she had to find out what the plant wanted. She had to find the orchidness of the orchid she had to find out that it was temperamental, that it was dry, that it did not want attention every day. <laughs> I'm anthropomorphizing this slightly. You can pick that up. She had to find out the balance of water and soil and light for that particular plant. It's easy for us, tending to ourselves, to fall into the habit of giving our roots what we think they want, water, every day, instead of what actually makes us grow. But more than that, what Terry told me is that if you love the orchid only for its flowers, you don't love the orchid. That the blooms burst aren't the whole of what the plant is. That an orchid is equally its quiet, drab days. An orchid is the infinitesimally slow motion of a new stalk curling upwards. An orchid is the turn of its leaves over days towards winter light. An orchid is the long, quiet weeks between blooms. And you can't mistake one part for the whole. The plant is not the flower. 
But I know that sort of mistake well in my own experience because I am and probably you are well practiced telling ego stories instead of soul stories, ego stories. For decades, or excuse me, decades, for a decade <laughs> of a successful career in corporate America before ministry, I learned and coached others how to tell the story of your life and career as if nothing has ever gone wrong, as if every experience you have ever had prepared you for this next job, and I'm so glad we're talking. And what are your strategic priorities for the coming year? <laughs> ego stories. This is, this is or orchid flower stories, ego stories. This is the uh, Quaker teacher Parker Palmer's terms. They try to portray us as in control and in charge of our lives. They are linear stories of continuity and consistency. They are highly crafted stories that leave out all the most important things and ignore doubt and fear and uncertainty, exile those from your life. They're what you say at a party when someone asks you what you do, and they do not sustain us in suffering. They are, in other words, stories of just one part of ourself, pretending to be the whole of us and fueled almost always by fear. The Chinese sage Shuang Tzu says in this wonderful, bracing, uh, awakening piece of two millennia old sarcasm, he says, produce, get results, make money, make friends, make changes, or you will die of despair. <laughs> but beneath the ego story is the soul story the one which knows well all the complicated parts of us. It's the story which honors shadow as well as light, which is unafraid of change and fear and loss, failure and shame, or of mystery and passion and ecstasy, which says these things are as much a part of me as success. That uncertainty is as much a part of me as clarity. Soul stories know that all of those aspects are parts of us, that we live in tension and seeking balance among them. And so these are the stories that we hold on to in the hardest times. These are the stories we want the people we love to know. The poet Mark Nepo writes this called Understory. He says, I've been watching stars rely on the darkness they resist, and fish struggle with and against the current, and hawks glide faster when their wings don't move. Still, I keep retelling what happens till it comes out the way I want. <laughs> we try so hard to be the main character when it is our point of view that keeps us from the truth. The sun has its story, no curtain can stop. It's true. The only way beyond the self is through it. The only way to listen to what can never be said is to quiet our need to steer the plot. And when jarred by life, we might unravel the story we tell ourselves and discover the story we are in the one that keeps telling us. Soul stories are whole stories. They don't leave out some part of you. That integration is part of our work here. It's one of the meanings of the words Chris said to open the service, the words that our worship leaders say every week, all of you is welcome and all of you is sacred. Don't leave any part of yourself out there. Don't come in here and tell the stories of how great everything is going all the time. Because we all know we're also people. <laughs> all of you is welcome. And all of you is sacred. Not shameful in failure, but human. Not mistaken in uncertainty, but alive. This is 
whole stories, the, these soul stories, which are whole stories, part of why I return regularly to the words in our call to worship this morning. Come in with all your vulnerabilities and strengths. Come in with your fears and anxieties and loves and hopes. For here you need not hide. You need not exile any part of yourself. You need not pretend or be anything other than who you are and who you're called to be. I haven't met a person with a beautiful soul who got there by placing some part of themselves in exile and keeping it there. I haven't met a person who in fear or self-hate or self-protection from trauma walled away their emotions and leaned hard against the door when they pounded for release and somehow through that became whole and grounded. Mm. At dinner time, my dog often wants to sit at the table. <laughs> he is friendly, he likes the company, his head is about level with the table, he likes the food too, but, but the command that I give him is to snap my fingers once and silently point two fingers with full outstretched arms toward the kitchen where he with sad and disappointed face, <laughs> grudgingly goes. But this same thing, two fingers, hand outstretched, not a word said, sent into exile, we do this with parts of ourself too. We do this with parts of ourself. And the work, instead of separating us like that, is to put these parts together. Integration work. I don't know of a step-by-step -step guide for nurturing a beautiful soul which works for everyone. So let me apologize if, if the title of the sermon made you think otherwise. <laughs> but as much as it would simplify things, for this to be a church with easy answers that always work, and if they don't, it's your problem because you didn't work hard enough, <laughs> that's not who we are. Our third principle is acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. To find ourselves, to find within ourselves the humanness of your own humanity, to find for yourself what is that constellation of light and sun and soil that you need, that lets you grow, that lets you flourish to find a way to let those exiled parts of ourselves back into the wholeness, which is not without tension, not without conflict, but real. Amen. Yeah.
This month, our offering goes to TGTHR together, another attention, uh, formerly known as Attention Homes. So I'm going to share an overview of what this organization does, and you'll be hearing more about it over the course of the month. Their focus is to end youth homelessness. And here's their, um, just some background information. Homelessness is not just a lack of shelter. It's the absence of a home, a place where somebody feels safe, comfortable, secure, and valued. Ending youth homelessness requires all young people to have a place to live, employment, access to education, wellness, and a supportive community. That's what Together has been delivering for 55 years. They talk about um, their organization further. The movement to end youth homelessness begins with understanding its causes. A lot of people think they know them. Things like mental health issues, substance use, and poor life choices. In fact, they're often symptoms caused by economic instability or abuse at home. Imagine having to handle day-to-day -day stresses while living outside with little or no support. Now picture yourself empowering somebody who experienced all that to build their path forward. They talk further about their justice, equity, diverse, diversity, and inclusion work. Together is committed to building a culture of equity, inclusivity, and nonviolence for all individuals, which is why they created a JEDI, J-E-D-I, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee in 2021, and they remain committed to ensuring their programs and community are a safe space for all individuals. They close by saying the time is now, the cause is just. Together we can create a community where every young person is valued, empowered, and safe. I invite you to give as generously as you're able. P.S. Sorry. Uh, you can make a donation now using the link posted in the video description by sending a check to UUCB or scanning the QR code with your mobile phone. May our gifts be used to enact justice, bringing peace and love to the Boulder community.
It's been good to be together this morning. Friends online, stick around. There's a Zoom room after the service if you'd like to visit and connect. And we'll do the same in person in the Sky Room in just a moment. But let me close with these words from the Polish poet Wyszlawa Zimborska, who writes this called A Few Words on the Soul. We have a soul at times. No one's got it nonstop for keeps. Day after day, year after year may pass without it. Sometimes it will settle for a while only in childhood's fears and raptures, sometimes only in astonishment when we're old. It rarely lends a hand in uphill tasks like moving furniture or lifting luggage or going miles in shoes that pinch. It usually steps out whenever meat needs chopping or forms have to be filled. For every thousand conversations, it participates in one, if even that, since it prefers silence. And just when our body goes from ache to pain, it slips off duty. It's picky. It doesn't like seeing us in crowds. It doesn't like our hustling for dubious advantage. Creaky machinations make it sick. Joy and sorrow aren't two different feelings for it. It attends us only when the two are joined. We can count on it when we're sure of nothing and curious about everything. And among material objects, it favors clocks with pendulums and mirrors which keep on working even when no one's looking. <laughs> Won't say where it comes from or when it's taking off again, though it's clearly expecting such questions. We need it, but apparently it needs us for some reasons, too. In the continuing hope and work of meeting our own shy souls, go in peace and amen. Let's rise to close in song. <laughs>